This week on Waterways. Diamondback terrapins and juvenile lobster virus. The diamondback terrapin. Its name tells us something about the animal. The diamondback describes the gem-like pattern on its shell, while terrapin is a word from the Virginia Algonquin Indians. The Virginia Indians used terrapin to describe all turtles, including the diamondback, which they hunted in Virginia's coastal creeks and salt marshes. Today, people use the word terrapin to describe the diamondback, the only turtle in the U.S. that lives in estuaries, the place where freshwater meets the sea. Scientist Brian Mealy has been looking at more than the terrapin's name. For the past 10 years, he's been studying the turtle in its native habitat in Florida Bay. He learned about toxins, disease, exotic predators, and DNA. But his first finding was to discover that the terrapin did live in Florida Bay. But essentially, we started working on bald eagles. And by working on bald eagles, like a lot of scientists, it's very important to keep the doors open on all sides of you. Uh, you have to think out of the box, look out of the box all the time. A lot of scientists are stuck within their own frame and they don't see anything beyond that. So the first thing you're doing at the eagle nest, we started noticing that there were some type of a turtle shell inside the nest. So with further identification, we came up with a terrapin. Despite the lack of reports from the Keys, the diamondback terrapin is an animal well known along the east and gulf coasts of the U.S. At the time of the American Revolution, planters and slaves living in Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia ate terrapin. In the 19th and early 20th century, terrapin meat was considered a delicacy. By the late 19th century, the animal was uncommon enough that a good-sized female could bring $8, well over $100 in today's money, Spared from hunting, terrapins had to next face problems associated with development. They lost their egg-laying beaches to break walls and houses. They got crushed on roadways. In some areas of the U.S., the terrapin is on the decline. In others, it is holding steady or increasing. But when Brian Mealy started his study, no one knew anything about Florida Bay terrapins. I think when we first approached and we, you know, we found all these terrapins in our hands, uh, you know, the excitement was, hey, we found a new animal and uh, that no one has reported in the area. And we went back to the references and to some of the library work in the park and it did have references of other researchers who spotted the shells inside the eagle nest. But no one actually took the time to go look for the live animals. So a lot of theories started to come into play. To test these theories about the terrapins themselves and their ecological relationship to eagles, Mealy went in search of live animals. Basically a mangrove island, uh, as we walk inside the island, it's going to be fairly wet. And that seems to be, in certain islands, a uh, prime habitat for diamondback terrapins. So let's head on out. This is one of eight study areas Brian and Greta typically monitor each month. When Mealy first searched for terrapins, he had to rely on his eyes alone. In recent years, he has attached radio transmitters to previously captured animals and can find them with a special receiver. Nothing in there? And nothing in there? Well, we're listening to the, the volume of the beep. It's getting louder and louder as we get closer. Then as I rotate this antenna, it kind of gets fainter where she's not. So where I get the strong signal, which is the head of this is the point of the antenna, the arrow, wherever this is going is, is my strongest signal that kind of leading us right to her. Since with radio tracking, what we're trying to do is the first step is you always listen with the antenna. And that kind of brings you into a close area. To give an idea if she's close by, you take the antenna off. Make a very faint signal. And that usually means she could be anywhere from 15 to 30 feet away. Let's track 
her down. Yeah, the difficulty in here is the fact that the substrate now almost matches the color of the turf. So she could be sitting right there in the open, but we're not even going to see her. And then with the glare now. Yeah, with the glare plus that. Right now, just... Can you do it without the wire again? Let me see. They can't scratch you. And if I put my hand out there, they oh. will they will try to bite. So <laughs> that's one thing people people have to watch out is when they do try to bite. After hours of collecting, the specimens are taken back to the boat for examination and to take measurements. Uh, but essentially right now is uh, we're going to be taking a scanner out. <laughs> this is our scanner. Uh, the scans we use is a company called Avid. And essentially uh, we kind of see if this animal's been marked before. Hold on. Yeah, she's a previously marked animal. And her number is a zero, begins with 021, which makes her about a 1998 animal when we marked her. We're going to have to stick our thumbs right about in here, in the IP region. And what we're feeling for here is basically palpating for eggs. And you can basically feel the eggs would basically be located in this region of the body. And by palpating very carefully and very gently, you can feel the eggs. Uh, thus far this year, we have not felt any eggs. It's not a good year for reproduction. If we do feel eggs, if we have to know the re how many eggs she has, we actually will take her back into the lab and x-ray her. And that way we can get an average count of what they have. So far, uh, the average count is about 5.75 eggs per female. Although Brian doesn't take blood from these animals, he has taken blood from others. The blood samples have allowed him to track toxins like mercury in the terrapins. It's right here, we have 1100, basically 1140. Wow. The other thing no one ever looks at is mercury levels in reptiles. You always hear them in bald eagles, ospreys, some of the higher trophic animals, the more charismatic megafauna, as a lot of like the people like to call them. But even the terrapins are being exposed to them, and their levels are quite high for the size of their animals, for their bodies. Where eagles average about 0.5 parts per million, which is right the limitation of a human consumption if we're going to eat an eagle, but we're not going to eat the eagle. Uh, terrapins are around uh, 0.3 parts per million. Now that's a, you're talking about a thousand gram animal compared to a 4,000 gram animal with the same amount of mercury. So the question is, what is that mercury doing to their system? That's the next step. Eagles that eat the terrapins undoubtedly get a dose of mercury from the animals. Brian has also taken DNA samples from the terrapins and shipped the samples to a colleague at Texas State University, who has found that these terrapins have their own fingerprint, meaning that this terrapin population is an isolated population a branch of the terrapin family tree that might have its own unique genes and characteristics. This makes their conservation even more important. To conserve an animal, the first thing you need to do is estimate how many individuals exist. Well, one of the things that we have been able to accomplish thus far with our 10-year project is to get a population estimate here in the bay, at least in the east side. And thus far, it's estimated that between all the islands on the east side of the bay, we probably have a population ranging from 1,300 to about 1,800 animals. That's the standard deviation, which is, to us, we aren't too sure if that, is that a good number or is that a bad number. So that's a, the first set of numbers that we have, and that's the set of numbers that we will be comparing over the years to see if that trend maintains. So if we have a stable population, we'll be able to determine that. One threat that might make the population unstable is the black rat. Turtles and birds nest on isolated islands because there are few predators. But unsuspecting boaters might have carried rats to some islands in the bay. Rats aren't a threat to adult terrapins, but they can dig up and eat eggs. Well, if rat is rat is our black rat is out there and he's actually 
a definite problem to the population. Basically what they're doing is removing new recruitment to the population. If you are eating the eggs, essentially what you do is you have a population of adults with no young taking their place as they die. Therefore, by cutting out that ladder, that rung of the ladder, you're basically severing the population. So eventually, these older animals are going to die. And if we do not have young animals taking their place, you could see the basically the extermination or the extirpation of that entire population in Florida Bay. So that's what we're trying to identify right now. Another problem for terrapins might be disease. Sea turtles sometimes suffer from tumors called papillomas. These tumors are common on sea turtles in the Florida Keys. Scientists aren't sure what causes the tumors. It might be a virus. Turtles suffering from the tumors become emaciated and might die. Neely is looking for skin and shell diseases like papillomas on the terrapins. On the terrapins about three years ago, we had a pretty severe drought out here and we started seeing a lot of fungus rot on their shells. Sometimes, you know, in captivity we call it scud. Um, through a biopsy, it kind of showed that at least the first initial steps, it was actually a parasitic algae. Who for some reason was able to compromise the carapace, meaning eating away the dermal plates, going into the bone, eating away the bone, and is then is basically uh, exposing the organs, which kills the animal. We probably have within a site out here, out of our animals, we have about maybe 900 animals marked in this island, uh, and we probably found 10 animals that were dead, and there were all open shells in the back. This right here is the first time we've seen this. There seems to be a growth on the bottom of it, and therefore it would be kind of very interesting to do a biopsy on that to see what it is. And is there any chance in sea turtles we're seeing these fibropapillomas, which is, they believe is viral, but they're not too sure exactly what it is, if we're beginning to see something out here on the terrapin populations. Though Mealy, as a scientist, is extremely curious about studying the terrapin for its own sake, his work also has practical benefits. It kind of gives me at least a little thought process that if I know that animal's healthy, chances are I'm going to be healthy. But if you have animals start showing up with diseases, high toxins in their body, high levels of mercury in fish and terrapins, you begin to question because we are also using this resource. So we're ingesting the same toxins, the same mercury into our systems and how are we going to handle it? So if we have animals that are basically clean out there, <coughs> with them, excuse me, then therefore we are consuming something very clean. But if they're not healthy, guys, we're not healthy either. So we better become very aware of the environment. And this is not emotionalism. This is not being, I love that little animal and he's so cute that I want to save him. No, this is about human survival. This is about us surviving in an environment. Throughout this nation, and especially in the southern United States, there are millions of people who depend upon food harvested in the waters surrounding the Florida Keys. This food is considered a valuable resource, but its abundance has limits. Spiny lobster, pink shrimp, grouper, snapper. The sustainability and vitality of this resource is a goal of many state and federal agencies. While the private sector ultimately benefits from the harvesting of this resource, it is governmental agencies that fund and conduct research and implement programs that help establish a healthy and balanced ecosystem. The spiny lobster fishery represents a critically important industry to the lives of many families in the Florida Keys. For more than a hundred years, the spiny lobster has been harvested in nearshore waters. And in many years, spiny lobster is only second to pink shrimp in amount harvested. Recently, a threat to lobster populations was discovered by scientists from Old Dominion University. In 1998, researcher scientist Mark Butler and his associate Don Berenger first discovered and confirmed the presence of a fatal virus killing many juvenile lobsters in the Florida Keys. 
somewhat size specific, but typically within about two months, three months time, um, they die. And the mortality rate once they acquire this disease is nearly 100%. It's probably like 98% of the animals. We've had only a very few animals ever survive this disease. So if they get it, they're dead. Scientists like Mark Butler and John Hunt from the Florida Marine Research Institute are on the front lines in the battle for ecosystem sustainability. Though they never intended or expected to find an outbreak of juvenile lobster disease, their decade-long work of monitoring lobster populations was designed to do just that, detect changes in ecosystem health, and recommend changes to resource managers before it's too late. Well, some of the first indications we had in the field when we were diving is that lobsters, which are oftentimes gregarious, like to hang out together, these lobsters were solitary, found only by themselves. They are quite lethargic, like many animals are when they're heavily diseased or sick. They, their body, their carapace oftentimes would take on a funny colors and had a lot of algae growing on them. That's because as they get sick, they st stop grooming themselves and don't care, take care of themselves as well. Is also because their immune function is being compromised and they're not able to retard that growth of things on their body as much like a boat bottom would be, would be uh, encrusted. Their shells would be encrusted if they're not taking care of themselves. To the researchers, the prevalence of the disease seemed to be dependent upon the size of the lobsters. For the smallest lobsters, who live in the hard bottom algae, Butler noted between a 15 and 20 percent infection rate. For the mid-sized lobsters, the ones that settle in sponges and seagrass communities, Butler noted between a 5 and 10 percent infection rate, although in some places up to 40 percent were sick. So diseases of that magnitude are um, are really unprecedented in many natural populations. If you think about human diseases, people get really scared. For example, West Nile virus, which might be you know 0.005% of the population. So we're talking about fairly high prevalences. And so from a population biology point of view, um, it's a little foreboding. The high infection rate coupled with almost 100% mortality rate sent John Hunt and Mark Butler into action. They knew nothing about this seemingly new disease and so the first question was, has the disease always been there? Or has there been a change in their environment that has brought about this epidemic? You know, I've sat with, with Mark Butler and with Bill Hernkind and with other folks that have worked here for a long time with juveniles. And we kind of sit and rack our brains and we don't have any real evidence, but we have this sense that just from the from a way a lobster looks when it has the late stage virus that we saw lobsters like that back in the 80s but not at the same amount so it's probably something that's part of the lobster population but for some reason has uh, had an had an outburst one of the first set of experiments we wanted to know about this of course is how might this virus be transmitted? And so we've done a series of laboratory experiments to try to understand how the virus transfers from one lobster to the next. It looks like one of the major reasons, that it, what ways it can be transmitted is by contact, simply like just by rubbing up against one another, being in close contact with one another in the dens like they oftentimes are. Um, if they eat um, diseased material, uh, diseased tissues, they could transfer it that way. Lobsters are not normally, this species is not normally cannibalistic, but if they were to eat small snails and gastropods that have it, so we, that was possible. We looked at waterborne transmission, whether it might come through the water, and that does not look like a likely transmission um, uh, uh, um, pathway, except maybe over very, very short distances. Butler soon enlisted help from experts at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science who specialize in crustacean pathobiology. They have since concluded that this virus, which is devastating juvenile lobsters in the Florida Keys, was a new species, not documented anywhere previously in the world. And again, what we're talking about are primarily very small juvenile lobsters. The most folks in the public, unless they're poaching lobsters, would probably never come across this uh, this disease because it does not affect the adults out in nature. We can, um, in some circumstances, get uh, injected and get some um, disease infectivity in adults, but it is one that primarily affects the juvenile lobsters when they're living in the algae and those hard bottom habitats and when they begin to occupy sponges. If you're hearing this news and wondering whether spiny lobster are still safe to eat, 
dying happily with the knowledge that viruses generally stay within a species. In any case, law-abiding spiny lobster eaters should have no fear since the disease is limited almost entirely to juvenile lobsters. However, while the virus may not infect people, it could affect them. When this disease kills off juveniles, there are no new lobsters to replace the ones now being caught. A couple of years after that discovery, harvest levels dropped from what had been very high harvest years in the late 90s to relatively low and one very low harvest year in the first years of, of the 2000 uh, to 2004 uh, time frame. Neither Hunt nor Butler is claiming that the virus has caused the recent decline in lobster harvests, but they're not ruling it out. While many factors can contribute towards diminished landings, the coincidence of increased disease prevalence is not lost on them. And so what we've had to do more recently is more detailed pathobiology is taking tissue samples and looking at it under a microscope and also some molecular biology involving some DNA probes that allow us to pinpoint that in fact it's the, it's the virus that's attacking these animals and killing them. Now that this disease has been observed, identified, and documented, there is still much work to do. Butler and Hunt are in the dark about many aspects of this new threat like how much of the larger Keys population is infected, and whether this disease is infecting lobsters in upstream areas like the Caribbean. Up to this point in time, the, our funding for this virus we discovered has come from the National Science Foundation, which funds uh, much of the nation's basic research. Um, it has not been funded by any um, state or local agencies, um, and we're now coming to the end of our federal funding. Um, we're having some discussions now with state officials where we may be able to try to get some longer term um, funding. The scarcity of funds poses a problem for these scientists trying to maintain a balance in the Florida Keys marine ecosystem. But in this case, even a little knowledge is better than ignorance. The answers they have found, while not complete, will help shape the future of the fishery. I need to have those answers so that I can say to my managers that are going to have to uh, make the decisions in a few years once we finish our comprehensive re review of the lobster fishery on how to manage this fishery and how much change should, should they recommend to our commissioners. I need to know the answers about the virus and its importance in changing the population structure of lobsters in the Florida Keys. The virus is a very, very big issue regarding the management of you know, what is probably our single most important fishery species here in the Florida Keys from all standpoints, be it commercial or recreational.